So I hope you all enjoyed the film art and welcoming James back to uh, open up for any questions that anyone would like to ask. Um, perhaps just if you'd start off with, you uh, have a quite a long history of making documentaries and uh, this is your first that's a music documentary. Uh, perhaps you could tell us a bit about the path you've had from where you started off and what got you to the point of making this film? Well, this film comes from my love of John Fahey's music, uh, first and foremost, and having met him in 1982. I did a radio documentary about him uh, early in my career uh, when I was at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. So I met him then and uh, stayed in touch with him for about 10 years. And um, you know, you meet people when you're a, uh, an everyday journalist and people will say, oh, it was really interesting meeting you and we'll stay in touch, which seldom happens. But for 10 years, every time Fahey was anywhere near Toronto, he would call me up and uh, we got together. And uh, one time I met him with Melody and she actually remembered the spaghetti dinner that I had made for them. And uh, so maybe that's why I got the commission to make the film. Um, I did a lot of work on musical subjects as a radio journalist, and I was involved as a story consultant on um, Bob Smeaton and uh, Gavin Kuhlman's wonderful documentary, uh, Festival Express. Um, it was kind of a major music documentary that I was certainly very involved in and uh, had done some print journalism about as well. But most of my work as a, a video film uh, documentarist has been on political or historical subjects <coughs> and uh, you know certainly Fahey was uh, a musicologist so um, there's history involved. The uh, film has quite a comprehensive span um, looking a very comprehensive span looking at where his music came from originally um, perhaps you could say um, what you think American primitivism means in a contemporary context and um, you know how it can be understood from the roots that you look at um, and understood more widely. Um, I think to me it means that he pared back the you know the real power and genius of American Delta blues music and um, various Appalachian and uh, New Orleans influences, and he kind of. Um, in a deceptively simple way, uh, reduced it just simply to six steel string guitars. And um, he was a classically informed musician, but I think from my understanding, from knowing him to the extent I did and reading his writings and listening to every bit of interview material I could, I think that he felt that, you know, Charlie Patton and Skip James were the Bartoks and the Stravinsky's of United States. He considered it to be classical music, and he was a classical musician, and he was treating it with the same respect that he would treat Bartok. Um, and, you know, oddly, uh, he could sing. Um, and if you listen to all his work, the very early stuff, and then at the end, and according to people who lived with him, he was actually a beautiful singer. But he decided that his art would just be to most of the time simply play. Um, guitar, and at first, for, for many years, exclusively acoustic. And then, of course, he picked up the electric guitar. So um, he didn't coin the phrase. Sometimes he embraced it. Sometimes he took the piss out of it. Sometimes he was resentful about it. He was certainly highly resentful about being considered a folk musician. He definitely did not consider himself to be, he used the German word, I think, Volk. He'd say, I'm not a Volk musician. How could I be a Volk? I'm from the suburbs. Um, and uh, so he, he had a, a love-hate relationship with some of the, the way his peers viewed the traditions that uh, they all loved. Um, anyone got any questions that they'd like to put to James? Oh, well, perhaps another one would be, um, obviously Pete Townsend's, uh, you know, I think I've been told this before. Perhaps Pete Townsend's, uh, the biggest champion of uh, his music, um, you know, in terms of stature and fame. Um, when you listen to their music, uh, do you see, um, do you actually hear Fahey's music in Pete Townsend's playing? Well, I do, but I'm not a guitar player. Um, by the way, of course, it's great to be here in Leeds for many reasons, but one is, of course, because I think The Who's Greatest Record was recorded 
just down the street, right? <laughs> um, so uh, certainly, um, uh, to my ear, who's next? When you listen to the songs that begin with uh, acoustic guitar finger picking, uh, you can certainly hear Figgy in that. Uh, Pete Townsend says that uh, when you heard the first record, you heard is called "The Transfiguration of Blind Joe Death," and um, that had changed his approach to guitar playing. It changed his approach to guitar playing because of the way that uh, Fahey treated American musics. The finger picking style, but like a lot of other guitarists, um, and I think this is true uh, of some other British guitar players, at least from re reading Keith Richards' um, autobiography, the idea of open tuning. And that Fahey uh, did some standard blues open tunings, but he invented a number of other ones. And uh, Townsend says that it was listening to, to uh, the Transfiguration of Blind Joe Death, where he figured out he's not tuning the guitar the way I do. He's tuned different. Mm -hmm. And then he started to uh, then he started to mimic the tunings and uh, and writing in those tunings, as Fahey did. So that's that's a very direct influence that would be, I'm sure, very meaningful to any guitar players here, and maybe as Stefan or, or or Cam want to talk about about that about when they're playing. We'll see. Uh, anyone got any questions yet? Yeah, yeah. Do, do you think um, Bailey's stature has increased in the years since his death? I can't quantify it, but I, I think yes. Um, I've, you know, the film has been out now since the end of September, and it's played here uh, in the UK in London, and it's played near San Francisco and a number of places in Oregon and in Vancouver to date. And um, every time it's played, there are young musicians in the audience, and we get lots of inquiries from people who are clearly could never have heard him play live, um, and you know weren't born when he was recording his his you know his classic works in the in the 1960s. So um, I think you know what Pete Townsend says at the end of the film is correct. He's um, you know he. Uh, He's going to be with us for some time, and when you listen to the um, the the amazing compositions that are in really the first ten years of recordings, um, I think that you know I would suggest that kind of like Brian Wilson, people will be doing that music for a long time in different ways. When we premiered the film in Salem, his adopted hometown, um, a classic chamber string quartet play to open the film. And, uh, you know, they weren't doing any direct Fahey compositions, but they were taking a classical approach to his music uh, and were inspired by it. And there was one person in the band who may have been over 40. Everybody else was in, the in their 20s. And then in Portland, an amazing musician who I highly recommend, that group was called uh, the Bohemian Enclave, uh, which I encourage you to discover their CD. Tim Knight's in it, and he he um, he recorded with Fahey in Oregon. But in Portland, a young woman, she's got to be in her 20s, Marisa Anderson, who's a blues um, instrumentalist, played. And she said that Fahey was her greatest influence. I mean, she might be 25. I mean, you know, how did that happen? Um, and, you know, and it was, you know, it was great to hear her. So, so I think that... Um, you know, he's a, he's a very, very significant artist, and uh, his influence is reverberating uh, uh, widely. Is that a lot of down there? Oh, hi. Were there any people that you approached uh, for the film that you weren't able to get? Um, we were in contact with uh, Thurston Moore and uh, Lee Ronaldo of Sonic Youth. And Lee Ronaldo actually wanted to be in the film, but by the time uh, he made that clear, we were basically out of money and out of time, and he was in Italy. Um, so it wasn't possible. But people were very forthcoming. Pete Townsend, um, you know, it took him six hours, and that's what the time difference between North America and Britain. Uh, to agree to be in the film. He, he, you know, he wanted to be in the film. He told us to do the interview right away and then let everybody know he was going to be in it because he said it would help us find the rest of the money, which it did. Um, so, you know, he is, a, he is a, a very generous and devoted champion of Pete Townsend. And, um, you know, when you're making a documentary, 
there are any kinds of other musicians that we might have um, got, you know, Leo Kotke, Rye Cooter, uh, Beck, or, um, we tried to get um, Robert Plant. Robert Plant, in many interviews, talks about the influence of John Figge on him and Robert Plant. What they claim that when they did Led Zeppelin III, they were you know, sitting in some cottage somewhere listening to Figge's Tacoma records. So, um, but, you know, we decided to make an hour-long film. I'm, I'm happy with the people that are in it. I can't think of anyone that, you know, I wish that we had. It was great to uh, be able to uh, meet Pete Townsend, and I'm very happy he's in the film. And I think with, um, with Joey Burns of Calexico and Chris Funk of uh, the Decemberists, um, and with uh, the guy from the, the, the No Neck Blues Band, Keith Connolly in New York, you get, uh, you get a sense of the different musicians you've worked with and influenced. So um, I'm happy about that. Hi. You and then you. Sorry. What was your personal experience of uh, John Berg? Uh He was the funniest guy that I ever met. He was really, really funny. Um, he was a gentleman. Um, he wasn't, I probably met him four or five times. Um, I drank with him. I never saw him get plastered. Um, I saw him engage audiences in, in very, very funny, challenging ways. Like, um, but uh, he was extremely well received at all those dates that I saw him play personally in Toronto. <coughs> um, and, uh, you know, I just invited him over for dinner one time he was in Toronto and he came by and he was tuning his guitar in the living room and one of my daughters, Jessica, who is one of the editors on the film was probably three or four then. He seemed to be very comfortable around children. And um, to me, he was just a really nice, extremely funny guy. And I guess because I've been listening to him since I was about 17 when I actually read an interview with Pete Townsend and um, Rolling Stone, and he'd said that he loved this guitar player, John Fahey. So I went and got John Fahey records. Um, you know, I just, I assumed that he played this serious acoustic music and that was all, but talking to him, he loved Jimi Hendrix, you know, and I remember he's told me on my next record, I'm going to do Layla. And I thought he was joking. And then I bought his next record and sure enough, he did Layla. Uh, so he loved, you know, he really had big ears. He liked lots of different kinds of music. So uh, mostly what I, on a personal level, what I remember was his humor. He was really, really fun. I'm sorry, I think there's a question there. So yes, sir. Fine. Did everybody you interviewed own a national steel guitar? <laughs> <laughs> Did it just follow you around? Uh, no, uh, the national steel guitar is actually um, the uh, friend of mine who's a guitarist and uh, owns a recording studio brought in his and other friends' uh, best guitars and we kind of decorated the set with the guitars. So that national steel guitar actually belongs to a guy named Sal Borg who's going to play next week to open the film in Toronto at a screening there. And he's, a, he's a very fine uh, uh, slide player who's, who's informed by Fahey and mm -hmm. others. Hi. Do you think Fahey will be um, thought of and revered like Charlie Patton is now in 70 years' time, 80 years' time? Well, I think to some extent he was by the 1990s. I mean, uh, I, the DVD will be released um, in early 2013. There's a long story on the DVD from Chris Funk of the Decemberists. He finished um, music school in somewhere in Illinois, uh, in Chicago, I believe. And he went to Oregon specifically to find John Fig. Uh, he went to the wrong city, as he tells in the story. He went to Eugene. He thought he was in Eugene. He wasn't. He was in Salem. But eventually, um, they met um, that young man from Toronto who's in the film, A.L. Senior, who's a, a musician. He met Fahey in New York. <laughs> Fahey invited him to go to Oregon. He had just graduated from music program at York University in Toronto. He went. He ended up being one of the people, along with Jim O'Rourke, who... Um, who put together the posthumous um, collection of essays, Vampire Vulture, 
And that's another thing that I, if you haven't, those of you who are interested in Fahey, um, he was arguably as great a writer as he was a uh, guitarist and composer. <coughs> I mean, his essays are incredibly funny and fantastic and informed. Um, and there's two collections, How Bluegrass Music Destroyed My Life, great title, uh, and Vampire Vultures. And if you read the liner notes to the records, um, you know, he was, he, his humor and his musicological knowledge and his, his uh, irreverence uh, come through all that. So um, I think that um, there, are, there were young musicians seeking him out as he sought out and found Skip James. Um, that seemed to be happening before he died. Um, and who knows what young guitarists are, you know, I'm sure in many parts of the world people are discovering fate. Maybe just one more if anyone's got one before the music, or I think, there we go. Um, I don't think Mary at the back, but um, I'm just, there's, like, there's an obvious reason why he was so uh, anti being called a folk musician, because it would make him look like he was pretending to be from the Delta or whatever. But I'm still interested, why, why did he react so much to being called a folk guitarist, and why did he really want to be called a he, um, he was deeply suspicious of um, the politicization of music. And uh, he didn't, uh, and if you read his writings, um, he, he thought the, um, you know, he, he believed in civil rights. And, you know, in his work, clearly he did a lot to champion African American music. But in his own mind, there was a very, very clear distinction between music and politics. And he was a musician, not a politician. And um, he, he didn't like um, the adoption of certain kinds of music uh, for political purposes. He was very suspicious of it. So he, he didn't like that part of the folk tradition. And as a musician, he thought a lot of people who were popular because of their politics, and this was his view, he thought were bad musicians. I mean, you can read, I and mean, then he insulted Pete Seeger's playing. Uh, he insulted Phil Oaks playing. He just thought, why don't they shut up about politics and learn how to play an instrument? I mean, that, that, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty much what he said. I think he thought that being a musician was a discipline enough. And he also thought specifically, and you know, he, you should read his argument about this in the essay called Skip James, which is a, a brilliant piece of writing in How Bluegrass Music Destroyed My Life. He, you know, at least as he understood it, when you actually looked at their lives, and he was a biographer of Charlie Patton, he said they weren't political. They were entertainers. They were trying to make money. And some of them did make money. Um, they weren't like campaigning for, you know, a political agenda that existed in the 1960s. They were living in another time. And he wanted to understand that time and not conflate it with the civil rights movement. Now, he may be right or he may be wrong, but he thought, it was very clear what he thought. Um, so that was his, his argument. He said, I'm a musician, not a politician. Don't bore me with politics. He was more, <coughs> he was more of a beat than he was a hit. Um, I think that's part of it. All right, thanks very much to James for coming, and uh, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you.